Let's begin to think about how God has made himself knowable and yet incomprehensible. Okay, so God has made, humbled himself so that he would allow us to be able to know truths about him. With how great God is above us and beyond us and in every way, shape, and form, right, that in his knowledge, in his power, in his majesty, the fact that we could actually, as little insects that we are, be able to know anything about God it is an amazing idea. God has humbled himself to reveal himself to us, and that is a great, great blessing. Uh, there's a, a systematic theologian, Bavink, who said that God can be apprehended. God cannot be comprehended. There is a knowledge. There is no comprehension of God. And so what he's saying there is we can know things about God, but we can't know everything about him. We, he's beyond our comprehension ultimately. But he has humbled himself so that we can know some very important things about him. And he reveals these things from the things he's made and most importantly from his word. Give me some ideas of some uh, things about God that we cannot fully understand. That are incomprehensible. Okay, the fact that he's always been there. We talked about that last week with his eternality. That it just makes your mind kind of trip, right? Trying, I think Corey and I, I think we were talking about that last week, right? The idea of God always being there. And it's the only thing, he's the only thing that has always been there. So we have trouble because everything we've known, seen, tasted, touched, all of our experiences... That thing has, a, has had a beginning. You know, the iPhone, it had a beginning not too long ago. The Bible had a beginning. Noel had a beginning. But God does not. So, what's, another, what's something else that's difficult or impossible to understand about God? Jack? Okay, the Trinity. Yeah, how does the Trinity work together? There's no comparison. God doesn't bring a comparison from nature, from anything he's made, so that we can say, you see the Trinity? It's just like and all analogies break down. Okay, what else? Ben? So it's not like God's power is not like energy that's used or unused. His power is um, is the battery that never goes, that never dies, right? <laughs> His power is incomprehensible. Sergio? Yes, his omnipresence. There, there is something about that we can understand. Um, perhaps, like Bob Inc., we can't understand all of it. How does that all that all that work, right? Okay. So, what are some things? Okay, go ahead, Josh. Yes, I had that on my list. Very good. You, <laughs> he's reading my notes again. <laughs> Yes, the understanding of Christ as 100% God and 100% man, and both at the same time, and he's not a divided person, he's not a quasi-superman, he's not a um, half of him human nature, half of him um, God nature, that he's not some sort of morphing of the two, um, that it's not any of those things, is makes the mind trip. It makes you, you um, boggles the mind. You can't understand how he's fully God and fully man. If you think that you understand that perfectly, then uh, I would say study that issue some more and you'll, you'll come across more problems with that and like that it was beyond your understanding. Okay, so another one is how sovereignty and responsibility go together. That, that's something about God and the way he works, that both of those truths go hand in hand and we don't quite know how they work together. Okay, so God has revealed things about himself. Um, 
Let's look at Psalm 145. We'll read some portions of that. We're going to see how the psalm communicates both of these ideas. Okay, Raquel, would you read verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 145? Okay, so from this section, what's, what is there that we can know about God? What does he reveal about himself here? Those, verses, those three verses. Yes, that he's great. That's great that he is great. Ben? Yes, he's a king. He's a ruler. He is the ultimate authority. What else? Yes, he's worthy of praise. Yes and amen. Okay, so then now would be what is something that he, he's re, that we cannot know? That he's unsearchable. That um, he is beyond our understanding. That even though these aspects that he's revealed about himself are, is greater than we can fully comprehend. Okay, so he, he goes on um, to reveal himself in this psalm as one who has, is kind. And how, in verses 3 to 10, about how he has wonderful works. In verses 11 to 13, about his kingdom. In verses 14 to 20, his kindness. And then the conclusion is he is worthy of our praise. So I'm just pointing out a psalm to you that has both of these ideas how God's understanding about him is in unsearchable, and yet he has revealed himself and has made himself knowable. Have you ever had somebody who um, communicated the idea of, well, well I, if there's a heaven, I really wouldn't want to go there because I think it would be boring. Have you heard that before? Often from a teenager, right? Or maybe you thought that way as a teenager. Well, the unsearchable nature of God makes it so that um, we, the, being bored in heaven is the farthest thing that will ever come in your mind when you're in heaven because of the very nature of God, that you will be there for eternity and you will not, he is unsearchable. It's inexhaustible. You won't get bored of knowing God. It will always be new every morning. It's like a, a sunrise. Whether you watch sunrises or sunsets, you know, and different people watch the different, um, some people watch the sunset, some people watch the sunrise. Whether you're early riser or, or you're up late. How is it that each sunrise is never the same? How is it that each snowflake is never the same? Um, God is one who you will never be able to get to the bottom of who he is and how wonderful and unsearchable he is. He's written a finite book, right? And that finite book in its riches is unsearchable. We could study this, this book for all your life and isn't it frustrating how you're like, I'll, never, I'll get to know like this much of a sliver really well and then I realize, okay, in this sliver that I thought I knew really well, I knew this part so much more than the other parts, even this part, I don't know, like I could and I should. Truly, this, this, this taste of God that we have in his word shows how unsearchable and wonderful he is. Okay, so the un, his unsearchable nature or that he's incomprehensible shows us uh, the glories of heaven. What about how he is knowable. Have you ever had anyone to tell you, usually after telling, talking to them about sin, judgment, often at the end of evangelism conversations, I'll have someone say this to me, well, 
say, well, when you get to heaven, you'll see that a lot of what you knew about God to be wrong. When you get there, you may be surprised to see me, but I'll be there. Even though I'm don't, I don't follow Christ, you'll be surprised to see me. Or there'll be a lot more people there than you thought there would be. Just wait and see. Has anyone ever told you that? Well, the comprehensibility of what God has revealed about himself helps us to know that there are definitive things he has revealed about himself. And that you cannot contradict those. Because he has humbled himself, he has revealed himself. And in his extreme arrogance to say, um, it's going to be this way, just wait and see. It's going to be this way, even though it's not what his word says. I know it to be true. Um, that's contradicting his comprehensibility or his knowability, what he has revealed. So it's a wonderful thing that God is, has made himself known, and yet he is beyond our understanding. He deserves worship for that. Think, let's think about his communicable attributes. How are, is he like us? If you look on your outline, we can read some scriptures together about some of those. Let's go ahead and make some assignments. Um, say, Keith, would you read 1 John 4, 7 to 11? And Josh, would you read Zephaniah? We are going to take, um, stand by for that. Probably, we're not, probably not going to read the whole 18 verses, but I'll, I'll sign. You're, you're going to get Zephaniah 1. And then the second Keith, would you take Luke 36 to 50? And then Jesse, would you take Isaiah 6? So what we're looking for is attributes of God that are communicable. In other words, they are, we can share in the, that attribute. We can, um, we can do the same. When God sets the example, we can participate and do the same, have the same attribute with us. That's what the communicable attribute means. Okay, so first, first John 4, 7 to 11, and we're looking for the attribute that's revealed there. Okay, so it should be pretty clear by repetition. <laughs> the, this is not a class for geniuses, right? <laughs> okay, so tell me the obvious. Go ahead. Okay, so then t now tell me, how is that love manifested? How is it revealed? P specifically in the text, what makes it loving? What has he done? Give me details. Okay, he sends his son to die. Did he have to do that? Did he have to take the initiative to do that? So since he didn't have to do that, that shows his love. That he doesn't have to act in that way, but it's out of his very nature that he does. That he's the one who takes the initiative. Give me another detail. So he's immersed in grace. How is that shown in the, in the verses? Okay, so he's manifested, and that's in verse 9. This is how the love of God was manifested toward us, or shown to us, that he sent his son. So he humbles himself. There's another aspect of his love, that um, he doesn't uh, bring us up to heaven and show us a vision of heaven from his throne and at how he's a savior. Instead, he becomes one of us. He humbles himself. Keith? Yes, how's that shown in the, in the verses? 
that we didn't show any love towards him. Very good, very good. So he's the one who who acts. It's not. Um, it's made very clear. We're not the one who's loving God first. Clyde? Yes, so now Clyde's um, bringing us ahead to the, the application here then. We need to be like God, and it's that's what the text says. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We ought to think of others and take the initiative in that. We ought to humble ourselves to pursue the love for one another. It ought to be costly to us to love one another. And it was costly to God. Do you see how these are, um, these are God's attributes worked out that should be in us? Okay, next text, Zephaniah. Let's turn there. You can find the Zephaniah because it's connected closely with the other Z, Zechariah. It's like H-Z-H-Z. -H -Z. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. Okay. Oh, yes. Some, some, Tom's giving us the page numbers. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so obvious. Okay, let's look, and we're going to read um, verses 14 to 18. Of chapter 1. So what is revealed about God here? Yes, God, that God will judge sin. How is that judgment described? Give me some details. It's bitter. What else? Ryan? Ryan? Yeah, see, um, even mighty men will cry out. Okay, it's imminent. It's near. That's the first line. What else? Sergio? Okay, so I'm going to be a great distress, great devastation. Oliver? Yes, and a lot of bloodshed. Blood poured out like dust. It's like blood will be as common as the dirt. And they're... Yes, all of, his, all of man's plans fail. Okay, so then... Think about... Uh, the importance of understanding multiple attributes of God and not highlighting one over the other. Okay? We talked about great love and now great here great wrath. Um, it's impossible to understand either one of those things apart from the other. We just, how was wrath in the last text? 
in first, in first John four. Anybody notice that? How, how was it there? Propitiation, a wrath satisfying sacrifice. And then there is love. So you can't understand love, the love of God. Apart, it's revealed by him satisfying his wrath. That's what he sent his son for. Okay, then how is love revealed in Zephaniah? I'll give you a little cheat because I didn't really cover that in the, in the uh, reading. Let's read the, chapter 3. Verses 14 to 17. Ralphie, would you read those verses? Uh huh. 14, 17. So here's one of the most beautiful pictures of the love of God. That he rejoices over his people with singing. How often do you read about God singing a song? Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear that? God sing a song? There's a special for you, right? <laughs> and it, it's a song about um, his love. That understanding of that love would not be understood without his without his wrath, his wrath being satisfied from being saved from his wrath. You would not understand um, how he's taken away your judgments in verse 15. Um, both of these things must be together. Okay, let's think of another attribute of God in Luke seven thirty-six to 50. I'm trying to give you a variety of texts, psalms and epistles, prophets, now here's the gospel. Luke 7, verses 36 to 50. And a little reminder, if you're in the cry room or you're at home listening on, online, you, you'll need to be following along with your Bible and reading it, since we have people reading here without a mic. Okay, go ahead, brother.
So tell me of some attributes of God that are revealed there. His forgiveness. So he's acting in forgiveness. So what does that tell us about his character if he acts in forgiveness? Yeah, his mercy. So his mercy, his loving kindness, tender heartedness, he has compassion towards even the most miserable and pitiable of his creatures. What else is revealed there? Sergio? His forgiveness. And that forgiveness shows us his grace, his unmerited favor, his willingness to treat his creatures not according to their own merit and worth, but according to his abundant kindness and overflowing generosity. What else? Mercy, grace, Ben? Yes, so he discerns Simon, right? And he is brings ju a just message to Simon, right? Yes. Think about um, what Ryan's point about patience. Who is he more patient with, Simon, or the woman caught the woman who is a prostitute, or with you, that you get to read in to this story? Think about his patience, not only with Simon, not only with the woman, but then with you that you are in with a dinner, beholding it, and seeing this story. He has patience with all of us. Doesn't he? With, uh, he? It shows his willingness to bear and suffer long with our weaknesses and wrongs of his creatures. His mercy, grace, and patience is revealed um, in, his very na in his names of God and in the nature of God. It's revealed in the biblical events. Manasseh, a king for 55 years, and most of it all, Horrible wickedness. Imagine if, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad laws being put in by our president now. Not to disrespect him, just be truthful. Um, and influences for abortion, killing babies, or homosexuality. And imagine if he doesn't have an eight-year term, but he has, imagine if he has a 50-year term. A 50-year term, how, how bad will it get after each decade, Right? And then imagine the mercy and patience of God that after 50 years of going worse, God saves the president. That's the story of Manasseh. What patience of God that, you, that when you go to heaven, you'll see Manasseh there. That is an example of patience, decade after decade. Um, a Christian killer, Saul, turned into Paul. What an example of patience. Rahab, a harlot, a whore, a prostitute, then becomes a great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. The prodigal son, a picture of God's patience. Blind Bartimaeus, the patience of God, kindness of God. That should, it should teach us um, to be humble, to be willing to bear with one another, to employ this with our enemies like the way the Lord does. Okay, more about God. We want to hear more about God. Let's hear Isaiah 6. Jesse.
We'll read Isaiah 6, I believe verses 1 to 8 should suffice. So, Wilson, tell us an attribute of God that you see there in that text. Yes, the pardon and forgiveness of God. Zabiel, what's something that you see there in that text? Amen. The holiness of God. You know, it's often been said it's the only attribute that he, um, that's proclaimed three times of him. Okay, so then tell me, what is holy, the holiness of God? Tell me an aspect of it. And we'll gather together. Jerome? So an important aspect, an attribute of holiness that Jerome is bringing out is the otherness of God. He is completely separate and different. We're not on the same scale. We're not close to him. We're not, uh, he is um, completely other. So, you know, an analogy that I've said before about that is, okay, so if, um, if you compare the, um, this chair... We'll take a wide one, and we compare it with Noel. Okay? Um, which has more value, the chair or Noel? <laughs> Somebody loves Noel. <laughs> okay, so we got the chair, we got Noel, and we'll take the pen that he's, you know, he likes to tuck a pen in his button-down shirts, right? A creature of habit. Or Noel, so we got the pen, we got the chair, and so which is the pen? Is the pen closer to the chair or closer to Noel, in in its essence of being? I think closer to the chair. Okay, now let's add another aspect into it. Um, God. We have God. Um, what are we closer to? Are we closer to the chair or are we closer to God in the essence of our being? We're closer to the chair. 
We're closer to this chair. We're closer to the pen. And it, what I'm doing by this analogy is saying by categories, God is not even in the same area. He's not, um, he is completely other. We're closer to a pen, we're closer to a rock, we're closer to waste, we're closer to an insect, we're closer to um, whatever image would humble you. We're closer to that than we are to God. Um, an angel is closer to those things than it is to God. That's why the angels say, holy, holy, holy is God. So in the idea of holiness, a very important key is that he is not on the, um, like us. He is other. That should make you tremble. It should make you full, be full of worship. And it's also key in the idea of holiness is the purity of God. That it, that's, um, so since he has an otherness and a purity it is n um, nothing like we can comprehend. Then um, the Word of God calls us to be holy, amazingly. Give me, tell me a scripture. Hey, you, do you remember a scripture? Certainly with a group this big, we can remember some. Tell me. Okay, First Peter, what does it say, brother? Yes, because of His holiness, then we need to conduct ourselves in holiness. Yes, Leviticus 11, that's where First Peter's getting it from. Old Testament, New Testament, it's, the idea remains the same. That we are to live holy lives because of his very character. His, how does it um, work in Isaiah's mind? He, it, he sees he must be holy, right? Like in the sermon, the Sunday sermon, when we know God, then we know ourselves, and then we'll know how to live rightly. That connectedness, you see that happen to Isaiah here very clearly, don't you? Where he knows God, and then what does he know about himself? A man of unclean lips, in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I mean, who's got the cleanest mouth in Israel, right? It's going to be Isaiah. He's preaching the word of God. And what does he say about um, the, his own mouth? That it's, he's unclean, he's undone. And he says judgment on himself. So then he knows how to live rightly out of that, right? Um, when the Lord cleanses him, he'll say, um, this Lord says, who will, shall I send? And who will go for us? And he says, here I, him, here I am. Send me. That's, he knows how to live rightly then from that, right? True wisdom. Okay, so we've seen so far that God has made himself knowable to us, and yet he's incomprehensible. We've seen that God has attributes that we need to share in. Love, justice, mercy, kindness, holiness. How is God not like us? Let's look at Psalm 139. What are there, there's attributes about God that we cannot copy, we cannot participate in or follow his example. He is beyond us. Okay, so, um, Guru, would you read verses 1 to 6 of Psalm 139. And we're looking for an attribute of God here. So what's the preeminent attribute? What's the attribute, Jack? Omniscience. That he knows all things. You see the, the verbs there? You've searched me. 
known me. In verse 1, verse, verse 2, you know my sitting down and rising up. Okay, there's not a time when God knows when you're, whether you're standing or whether you're sitting, you're, lay, you're lying down. He knows all your times. He understands your, what you've done. He understands your thought. He understands your path. He understands all your ways. Yes, he, he does. He does know us much better than we know ourselves. Okay, read verse, let's read verses 7 to 12. Uh, Nikita, would you read those verses? So, Brianna, what's the what's a, a key attribute here in verses seven to twelve? <laughs> yes, his omnipresence. Um, can you go to hell and get away from him? Can you go to heaven and get away from him? Um, can you get in the darkness and can he not see you? Okay, now what about in verses 13 to 18? And Clyde, would you read those verses? So here we see the power of God. The power of God manifested in how he skillfully makes us. We see how uh, he's the one who can do this work. Um, he's the one who, who has ordained not just our being and who we, we, that we would exist, but in our, our very days. This is in his power he has made you, and in his power... He has ordained your days. So our God has a power that is beyond all others. He has a presence that is everywhere. He has um, a knowledge that um, is incomprehensible, beyond us. Think about how Christ knew um, that... Um, how the, what the disciples are thinking before he gets there. He reads their thoughts. How he reads Simon um, the Pharisee's thoughts. Think about how Christ is present with us when he tells us the Great Commission. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Think about how Christ is the one who has manifested his power over demons, over nature, over death itself. Christ has the very, is the very image and perfect representation of God to us in all-knowing, in every place, in his power. Okay, so God has revealed himself in these varying ways. Another key attribute of the way God has revealed himself is his decrees in providence. His decrees in providence. So let's turn to Isaiah Isaiah 41.
So in this day today, we're understanding about who God is. It should give us a wisdom to understand ourselves and apply, and then understanding of how to live rightly. Okay, so providence is when God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that he keeps them existing and maintaining the properties which he created them. He cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do, and he directs them to fulfill his purposes. There is not an atom gone astray. Nothing happens by accident. God rules and reigns over it all, and he does good in everything that he does. His decrees are his eternal plans where he has, before the creation of the world, he is determined to bring about everything that happens. And he does perfect, and he's holy in it all. That, that's a mind boggler. That's, I mean, that's the word for the day, right? Boggle. If that doesn't, when you have a class about God, it should, confu- it, should be, um, it should blow your mind. The fact that God can be holy and ordain, um, ordains the world. It is a insane thing. That's how he's able to give prophecy, and no one else it does, because it's not a it's not a forecast of what will where it will rain and what not. Seeing ahead, what happens? No, it's in ordaining. It's something that he has planned that will come to pass. There's not a question about it when he gives a prophecy. It's as sure as if it already happened. We just get the benefit of seeing that it already has happened in the occurrence of events. Okay, so in Isaiah 41, we see uh, we see God Himself reveal the test for who the real God is. Okay, so we're going to read um, Brenda Davidson. Would you read Isaiah 41: 21 to 29? Yep, go ahead to verse 29. So, Ricardo, what is the attribute, or what's the test here that shows who's a real God? What's the test here that God brings forth to show who the real God is? Yeah, he doesn't take pleasure in idols, but what's the difference that he shows between the idols and him? Jesse? Okay, 
Okay, so he raises up Cyrus. Okay, so um, look at verse 26. Who is declared the, from the beginning that we may know? In the former times that we may say he's righteous. Okay, who's the one who does that? God. Okay, so do you understand what's happening in the text? Verse 21, he says, present your case. Okay, let's, let's see. Um, it's, we're going to court. What's your case for who, who the real God is? We're, um, here's the case, verse 22. Let him bring forth and show us what will happen. Okay, so he, here's the test. Um, tell me the future. Tell me the future in detail, hundreds of years in advance, what's going to happen? That we may know and we consider. See the verse 23? Show us the things that are to come hereafter. That we may know that what? That you are God's. Okay. And we do this with Islam, right? Tell us, if, where's your prophecies, Islam? Buddha? Um, chubby guy in the Chinese restaurant, right? <laughs> what, do you, what do you got to say? What do you got to say about the future? Now, I don't want to, no fortune cookies, right? And there's no future, the real prophecies in those. Where's the case? Tell me the case. Where's the real God? Let's indeed verse twenty four. Okay, he listened, and what does what does Isaiah hear? Crickets. Crickets. So verse twenty four. What's the summary? Indeed, you're nothing. Your work is nothing. And who he who chooses you is an abomination. Okay, so here's how you know the test for the real God. So anyone who um, can see this test fail, if you still choose Buddha, if you still choose a Muhammad, you become an abomination to God. So in contrast, verse 25, he tells a prophecy in detail, and it turns out with Cyrus, the coming king. He's like, just to show off, here's a prophecy. And then back to the case, he's like, see verse 26, I'm the winner. Who's declared it from the beginning that we may know? In the former times that we may see, and he say he's righteous. There's nobody who shows, there's nobody who declares, there's nobody who hears but me. You see how God is the one who decrees. Now, when we read a prophecy, everybody likes that. You know, everybody who's in Christianity, they like that. Yes, God tells the future. The majority, everyone... Now, the problem is, when you get to think about that in detail, that if God ordains all things, that um, calamity, like Amos tells us, calamity, the storm comes to a city. Does it come to the city apart from the work of God? Okay, so there are no Katrinas that happen apart from God ordaining them. So the question is, there's, there, think of all the evil that has happened in the world. The Holocaust, the uh, the immorality, children being killed, abused. Think about all the evil that happens. We have a problem here. If God decrees, how is there still evil? How is there still evil? Um, there's, there's insufficient answers to that that a lot of Christians bring up. Well, it's Adam and Eve's fault. Well, even the child can answer and say, well, then why did God let, allow it? Why did God allow it that they could get the fruit? Why did he even give them access to it? Why did he even make that tree? Insufficient answer. Well, somebody will say, evil must exist, um, evil must exist for good to exist. That's why God's allowed evil. Insufficient answer. In heaven, there's not going to be any evil there. Well, free will. God gives us free will. Well, God's the one who even um, gave free will. So if he, since he gave it, he knows what everybody's going to do with it, even if there was free will. So that, uh, that ruins that. Insufficient answer. Well, God will one day deal with evil. Yes, that's true. He will one day deal with evil. But how, why did he allow it in the first place? Insufficient answer. What's the, what's the real answer? Habakkuk tells us, and we'll hear it in the call to worship, Habakkuk tells us that it is um, God knows better, and he ultimately brings it about to good. 
he ultimately has allowed evil for a time to bring about a greater good. He is the surgeon that uses the scalpel that you cannot use. He does what you cannot do. He has an ultimate good purpose in allowing history to unfold the way it has because he is a greater good that we cannot comprehend. He does what you can't do. He allows evil for a time. And yet he is good in his purposes. He is an ultimate good. And that you can't see. You have to trust him for that. You have to have faith in that. Okay, so to, um, to close real quick, there's a, there's a um, young lady who, um, she was attracted to a particular guy. And this guy started to spend time with her. She, he was a godly guy. And, um, you know, she fulfilled all, or he fulfilled all her greatest dreams. And she was spent, they were getting time together, getting to know each other, enjoying each other, laughing. And then he invited her out to lunch. And, he, and she thought, this is it. This is the time where he will, um, he will ask me to court him. And so she gets all ready, you know, and prepares for that like ladies do, all that stuff. It took a long time, long, long, long time. And she shows up and he says, I just want you to know, I just want to be friends. And, um, and then she goes home, driving back in her car. You know, the, the tears come down with the makeup doing the makeup and she thinks not so much about him but she thinks about God God why um, why did you allow this to happen you allowed this to happen just so it would hurt me um, and uh, what happens is um, in the drive home she basically has to decide is God good in what he did She's like, I know it's trivial. I know that it's, um, people are dying. But this hurt me. This hurt me. And God, you allowed it. How are you good in that? In the, in the drive home, she knows it's sin. She knows what she's thinking about God as evil. And she decides, I'm not going to, um, I'm going to keep on driving until I'm, I'm repentant. What is the scripture I should be thinking about? And she thinks, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job could learn and trust God that God is doing a greater good. Can't I in this lesser situation? That's the faith, the faith that um, trusts God that he has an ultimate good in mind. That does not come by experience or by knowledge on your own. It comes when God reveals himself and gives you saving faith where you trust the goodness and the character of God. Yes, Debbie? Yes, amen. That's a, the perfect way to close. Yes, well, God, what we meant for evil, God meant for good. That's the, his faithfulness. Let's uh, close in prayer. Dear Lord, we worship you, and we... We know you are good. We know you're good and that you have a, a great um, good in mind. I think of the testimony with the guy Richie was evangelizing in the accident that he was in. And Lord, I pray that you would bring about a greater good of salvation and from that car accident. And uh, so Lord, I, uh, we trust you and we look forward to uh, when you will return. Amen.